Lord. Anything and everything that's not of you, we give you permission to cut it out. Amen. Amen. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, God, for grace. Real grace, God. Real grace that empowers real truth. Father, I am so thankful that I get to share my heart no matter where I go. This is a special place to me because I laid on that floor for like a year and a half. <laughs> and this is my church. I just honor pastor, honor his wife, honor John, I honor staff here. Just thank you, God, for what they're doing. God, let there be a word coming out of me that's going to help to empower <clears throat> this move of God that will never end. Father, I thank you for the purity, the uncompromising word, the reality of the truth that's in this book. I just love you, Jesus, with all my heart. Thanks for saving me. <laughs> Thank you for setting me free from me. Jesus, I'm asking you to help people be free from themselves, God. I ask you to help people be free from selfish desire, God. I ask you to shut up people's itching ears, God, that want to hear just anything and everything they can. God, I ask you to hone in the believer's belief system to normal. Father, I ask you to amplify your son. Let the blood of Jesus purge us, cleanse us, and set us free, God. God, I ask you For the fear of the Lord, I've asked you since the beginning of my life. For the fear of the Lord, God, to be upon my life. To tremble me and shake me if something's not right. I'm asking you to impart that to people tonight, God. That they wouldn't be afraid like everybody was with Moses. God, I'm asking you for Christ in us, the hope of glory, to shake us so that our senses can be trained, God, to discern between both good and evil, God. I thank you for righteousness, and I thank you for training in righteousness, God, so that the man of God, women of God, can be approved. That we would study the word, we'd rightly divide it, so we'd never have to be ashamed, ever. We'd never walk in fear. God, I thank you for your love that's so profuse, so simple, God. And we've complicated it. And we've made it about trying to get to you when you paid such a price to get to us, God. I'm asking you to make it simple again. Father, let us return to the simplicity of the gospel that's in Christ, God. I thank you, Father, that we would walk as examples in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation, God, that we would shine as lights, God, as lights, that the darker it is, the brighter we'd shine, and we'd never fear darkness, God. We'd never even sense darkness. Who cares about feeling darkness? We're children of light, not darkness. We were dark, now we're light. It's different. Father, thank you for grace in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. If that was just for me, that's okay. Because my heart trembles when I get a microphone. It's so crazy. I'm like, man, I can't wait to come up. I can't wait to come up. Then I come up, and I'm like... Oh my goodness. Because I'm responsible for all your ears. I'm responsible, man. When I have a microphone, I'm responsible for everybody that hears me. I'll answer before God because of everyone that hears me, and I take that. That's a big deal. I don't count the blood of Jesus just some whatever thing. It's not some whatever thing. It's the blood of the king. We weren't redeemed with silver or gold. We were redeemed with the precious, the precious blood of Jesus. We can't count it some, some worthless thing. Listen, man, we're in a day and an age where the blood of Jesus isn't as strong as it is 
as you think it is when you travel the world. It's still as strong, but the preaching on it isn't. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I just don't have anything else to talk about. Nothing. Nothing. Because if the miraculous doesn't come out of what Jesus did, so you can, the disciples did miracles and weren't even saved. And they wanted to blow up cities. They did. They walked in the miraculous and were like, Who, who's the best? Jesus is like, well, if you want to be great, you've got to be the least. I mean, they're walking with the king of kings. And Jesus was really, like, gracious with them. He knew that they were orphans and they weren't going to be anything but an orphan until he went to do what he did. And you can't afford to think as an orphan. All creation, all creation is groaning for you, for you to manifest your father. All creation is groaning. They're crying out for you to manifest your dad. It doesn't sound like you think it sounds. I'm in malls and everywhere. I'm always talking about Jesus, man. Some people freak out and cuss me out. They're just groaning. See, we don't think that way. We're afraid that we might get a you know, offend somebody. I'd hate to have to worry about offending somebody here. I'm more conscious of somebody going to hell then. I can't live with that in my life. God set us free. He set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free. We're not supposed to press towards freedom. We're supposed to live from freedom. Jesus is freedom. You know, heaven's answer is Jesus. There will never be another one. <laughs> heaven's answer is Jesus. I was just reading, I was reading a lot today, but in one of the places I was reading was Hebrews. Hebrews 3, verse 7 and 8, right in there, when it says, Today, if you'd hear his voice, don't harden your heart, as in the day of rebellion. We're like, yeah, but he was talking about them, not us. No, he's talking about us. There is an absence of rest in the body of Christ because we don't understand the cross, the finished work of Jesus. And there is a place that I've had the pleasure of living in for 10 years, almost 11. We're going on 11 right now. People told me in the beginning, man, you better chill out. You better slow down, bro. Listen, this is like a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm like, that's not in my Bible. It's really, it's not. There's no marathon, no sprint about it. It's run. But it's run with grace. The grace of God is the most beautiful thing. Grace empowers us to walk out what truth calls us to. But if you always go to a conference to find truth, you'll be deceived. Because Jesus paid a price for you to receive grace and truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus. He paid a price for me to have relationship with my father, not as an orphan, but as a son. And I've known I've been a son for 10 years. Like, I got born again and have a brand new dad. Even though my natural dad's amazing. My brand new dad is like more than amazing (laughs) like when I got saved it was like night and day and people have told me well Todd you know not everybody gets it like that what are we doing it's the gospel it's the simple gospel I couldn't read I never read a book 34 years never read anything couldn't finish a book because I couldn't understand what I was reading and then I got saved and the Bible's the first book I can understand And people are like, well, that's not, like, everybody's not that way. No, no, no. If you find out who God says you are, you are that way. Sometimes we look in that thing and we're not getting it and we're, like, wanting someone else to help us, so we read a bunch of books about the book, but never establish relationship. And then we we go after this and this and this and this and this and this, and we have all these different things that could be God. But Jesus paid a price for us to not say, who do men say that I am? He paid a price for us to know, who do you say I am? You're the Christ. Oh, blessed are you. He paid a price for us to all know that God's our Father. For us to all know that we're sons and daughters. And sometimes our pursuit is after a bunch of different stuff. Listen, I'm not against the spiritual gifts. I walk in them all. They're mine, because they're His. And He says that He's mine. So I don't preach against Him. But if your pursuit is just earnestly desiring the spiritual gifts at the cost of pursuing what it means to be a son, you'll be deceived. You will walk in gifting and think that your last miracle validates who you are in God, and that's not true. That's not true at all. I live in the miraculous every day. He lives in me. He wants out. 
my greatest joy, my greatest joy, I love doing conferences, I love preaching with Reinhardt, I love going over in Africa and speaking to 700,000 people, 800,000 people, a million people, that's amazing. I love speaking here. I love speaking everywhere. But I love my one-on-one -on -one time with my father. More than anything is that time right there. Just me and him. Him and me. And I love that with all my heart. That's my greatest love. I read the hard pages. I do. I read the men I've been camping out in Timothy. It's the most amazing book ever. It's so good. It's telling me to be strong in the grace. It says no one engaged in warfare engages himself, no, or no one entangles himself and snares himself with the affairs of this world because he's enlisted. He's going to please the one. I'm already pleasing to him. He loves me. He's pleased with me because I believe the simplicity of the gospel. I believe that Jesus is enough. Is enough. I believe that Jesus satisfied and, and actually paid a price for the wrath of God. He drank a cup that I could enter into a place by grace as a son, not an orphan, as a son, knowing who I am in Christ, and the Bible reveals that to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, it's talking about the wisdom of man, trying to get there and trying to get out, and, and then it goes and it shifts over to being spiritually minded. The things of, of God are not, are not understandable to carnal man. There is no understanding at all. Your carnal mind isn't built to. So you have to die to live. It's not you must decrease so he must increase. That's not how it goes. This isn't John the Baptist said I must decrease and he must increase. It's John the Baptist and the law must decrease while Jesus and righteousness and truth must increase. If you say, I must decrease and he must increase, you'll always be worried about trying to get yourself out of the way. You can't. It's he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It doesn't say, deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It's not, the devil's not your problem, you are. It says, deny yourself, but self has to do with your thinking, with the way that you think. There's a way that seems right to a man, and it's killing us. And you can't afford to incorporate the way that seems right to a man into the way that is right, and that is righteousness. The carnal mind is at war against God. It's an enmity against God. I can't afford to read that Bible with my carnal mind and think that I know it because I can quote it. The only scripture that we really know is the one that we can walk out. God doesn't want us to just be quoters. He didn't say be professional quoters. He said be in relationship with me. My word is alive. It's sharp and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide and separate the soul from the spirit. So the first thing the word does is it comes and it cuts this thing. It separates the way that seems right to a man. I can't afford to read the word and memorize it and think I got it. That's not it. It's called this. This is the best thing you could ever do right here, man. Right here. It's the best thing ever. This is where everything is. See, sometimes we think that if, if, we, if we don't pursue the gifts, if we don't pursue this, if we don't pursue that, then it'll never happen. You're deceived. It's not true. If you get him, it's everything. When you have him, you have everything. If I don't do this and I don't meditate and I don't get in the Word and ask God to reveal Himself to me, you read that stuff and say, God, my life isn't what this says and I need it to be. Help me, Father. This is who you say I am. God, make me become this Word. Don't you dare read your Bible to teach somebody. You get in there, you open it and say, God, this is like looking in a mirror. This is who you say I am. Here I am, God, your son. Show me what it means to be a son. Go after that with everything you are. Men, I've lived 10 years with no condemnation, no guilt, no shame. Not one day, ever. It's not mine. Ever. But when I talk to the body of Christ, it's not common. And it's, it's a shame. Because we're listening to the devil. We're being manipulated by the liar. And God forbid you learn how to heal the sick. And then heal them and think that that's okay. And sleep with your girlfriend. That's not okay. Some of you don't want to hear this. Get over you. <laughs> oh man, no way, dude. God doesn't ever give me a pulpit and expect me to compromise who he is. I will never compromise anything to get a pulpit, ever. 
I love you way too much for that. I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm not mad at you. I love you, but I can't stand what the devil's doing. He's a manipulator. He's a liar. He's finished. He's cut off. And he's trying to recreate himself in your soul. See, the devil tried to dethrone God. He tried to rise himself above God. Do you understand that? And he got kicked out of heaven. And God put him here. But you know what? The devil is trying to reproduce himself in the soul of man, in the mind, will, and emotions of man. So what he wants you to do is he wants you to have a great confession, but he never wants Christ to be throned in your soul. So he's trying to kick Christ off the soul of man. He's trying to dethrone Jesus from the soul of man so that you have a confession, but your heart's far from him. He wants you to incorporate Jesus into your life so that you can have a better day. He wants you to come to Jesus. Come on, Jesus, give me a better day. He wants you to be pursuing a better day instead of a brand new life. He wants you to pray to God and, and God not answer your prayers and you get mad at God. Come on, man. The Bible says that we're supposed to be like Jesus. Do you know what? Sometimes we've taught people that they're such mark missers, that they're such terrible sinners. And, and man, I, sin was an issue. But when I got saved, Jesus removed it. Listen, he didn't just forgive it, he removed it. Then he gave me a brand new heart at the same time. And then he told me to diligently seek him. And he said, if I do, I'll find him. He said, if you search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. It says that he, it's his good pleasure, don't fear little flock, it's his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. He wants to give me everything and it's all about him being my father, me being a son. And everything comes through Jesus. If you wake up a mark misser and that's your conscience, if that's your conscience is mark missing, you will miss the mark. But if you wake up a son, see there's a difference between waking up sin conscious and son conscious. When I got saved, I immediately woke up sun conscious and I filled my heart with truth and I'm possessed by what my father thinks about me. He has more thoughts than there are that outnumber the whole the whole, every grain of sand on the earth and every thought is for my welfare. Man, if you knew five of those thoughts, it would rock your world forever. And I'm not just talking about quoting those thoughts. I'm talking about knowing those thoughts, knowing them, experiencing them. Firestorm. I feel like a fire hydrant, man, because I have so much in me. I, you have no idea. I'm just like... I'm just getting started. I love you with all my heart, but I want you to finish well, man. We need to have our conscience cleansed. We need to have the reality of the blood of Jesus clean, clean our conscience. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works so I can serve God. But if I don't have a clean conscience, I will do things for God or do things to get to God. Or I will think that this is okay. Am I pleasing to you now, God? How about now? How about now? It's not okay for you to think, how about now? It's not. We need to have relationship with the Lord. We need to have our intimacy restored. People say, man, I remember this. I remember going to hospital. First time this happened to me. I'm like six months into my, into my life in Jesus. And I went to the hospital to pray for somebody. Now, this is at the time when I was about, now, I'm, I am... Five and a half months into heavy persecution from my wife. She couldn't even stand that I pray for people. She couldn't stand it. She'd tell you, she's amazing. She couldn't stand it. She told me, I will never go in public with you ever. For eight and a half months. Now this is after 22 years of addiction, nine years with her, threatened to kill her for nine years. This is after all that. Then we get married because everything changes. I went away to Teen Challenge in Harrisburg here. Come home ten months early. Completely. I mean like so radically completely free like crazy and she had given her life to Jesus and we get married four days later like it was the craziest time ever and now two weeks into this thing I find out that Jesus wants to touch people so I'm praying for everybody <laughs> and she will not even go in public with me I will never go in public with you again and that happened for eight and a half months straight so I'm right in the midst of that not just that her mom her brothers, my whole family, I'm a lunatic. I am. Except I'm not out of my mind, I'm out of theirs. But I am free, dude, I am like so excited and so free that I never told, I never ever, I never ever told my wife that she was wrong. I never did. I never said, you're wrong, you need to listen to me, you need to submit. 
what kind of trash is that? People use that stuff. You need to submit to me, I'm your husband. What is that? That's demonic is what it is. Why would your wife not submit to somebody that doesn't love her like Christ loved the church? What are we thinking? That's just twisted. It's easy for a woman to submit to Christ. It's a really good word to hear women yelling, yeah. Men, there's some men that went like this when I said submit, and then the women are like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in, I'm in the hospital, I'm praying for somebody and like, it, it, I never told her she was wrong I'd always go in my bedroom and just thank God for the woman that gave me I can't, it's like still just as brand new today because people aren't your problem, you are it's not them, it's you what do you mean, you're right, you should pray for people she's wrong, she shouldn't say anything you know you could be very wrong about being right that's not a good thing. Why wouldn't I just, why, instead of trying to sell my wife my fruit, why wouldn't I just let her pick it? Instead of trying to sell my family my fruit, why don't I just let them pick it? Jesus was like a lamb led to the slaughter and was silent. And my Bible says that we're supposed to be imitators of Christ. Be imitators of Him. Not to pop off and tell everybody they're wrong. Man, you can walk out righteousness and your fruit, look, your tree will bear witness of what kind of, like your fruit on it will bear witness of what kind of tree you are. Man, and if, you're, if your branch, if your roots go down into the right stuff, into the love of God, and your branches, and your roots dry, draw up nutrients, your tree's going to bear some kind of fruit. That fruit actually in Romans 6 it says righteousness bears its fruit unto holiness. And man, if you bear holy fruit, there's seed in that. Man, that fruit will drop around your family and they'll get rocked. So I'm in the hospital and I'm praying for this lady. And I remember, there's a nurse there. I'm by myself. I just, someone said there was somebody sick. So I'm like, I'm going. So I'm in there, they're, they're really sick. And I'm praying, I'm Father, I just thank you. I'm praying all that I know how. I'm only a couple months old. And I come out and the nurse looks at me. She goes, oh, that was beautiful. I said, oh, okay, thank you. You're a Christian? Absolutely. I've been one for 30 years. I said, that's awesome. I was so excited. Uh, listen, I, I don't know how it's going to be 20 more years from now. I'm growing every day, dude. Nobody can stop me. The devil can't. He can't stop me. He should have killed me when he has the chance. You don't understand. He can't stop me ever. Nobody can stop me from pursuing my father. Nobody can. The word tells me who I am. How can somebody tell me? How can somebody tell me not? Do you know my father has accepted me in the beloved? How can you reject me? How can you take away what you never gave me? Oh, dude, ain't gonna happen. I am so in love with God that you can hate me and I'll still love you. People are like, well, you don't know my family. No, you don't understand. Your family isn't your problem. You are. People don't even like that. We don't know what I've been through. Stop coming up with all these excuses. It's called surrender. See, the problem with this thing is a lack of submission. All you got to do is push your chips to the center of the table and say, I'm in. That's it. Period. That's it. It's about being all in. There is no compromise in this thing, man. It's not 90 in and 10 out, 80 in and 20 out. You're either all or you're not. Can you imagine buying water? Can you imagine buying water that says 99% pure? Would you buy it? 99.5, 99.9% pure water. You'd be like, I'm going with Fiji. <laughs> for real. You know what my, my hardest comment is? The hardest one for me. People come up to me and they go, Todd, you're the real deal. And I sit there and I go, man, breaks my heart because we're all supposed to be the real deal, man. If you're not the real deal, you're fake deal. I just like I know what they're saying but it's not supposed to be that way we are supposed to be the light of the world we are supposed to be a city on a hill we are supposed to be a light that lights up our own house 
that no matter how dark your house is, when you're there, it's not. Unless you're afraid. And if you're afraid, it's because you don't know Him. Listen, I, I, there's, there's nothing else that can make you afraid. If you know Him, you'll never be afraid. Because when you know Him, you completely have given up. Because there's no way for you to know Him until you do. You can know about Him. There are so many places in the Bible that validates everything that I'm talking about. If this thing opens up to you, every time you'll read, you'll go, oh, it'll be the same thing. <laughs> oh, because that's what happened to me. I, you know, when I came into this thing, I said righteousness. I, I, I've been going after it. I've pursued it. I pursue it. I still do. I can't get enough of it. The whole Bible is training in righteousness. It's training. It's training. Every day it's training in righteousness. I read the Bible and I see my right standing. Oh, man, this is amazing. People are like, how are you growing so quick? I just read. <laughs> I devour it. I listen to it. I watch it. Constant. It's just constant. If I'm working out at the gym, I got my iPod on. I got, the, I got the word going in my ears. I'm working out. People think I'm jamming. I'm listening to the word, dude. <laughs> I'm working out today. Working out. It's it. Dude, it's full body. It's a full body workout. <laughs> God of peace wants to sanctify us completely. Spirit, soul, and body. It says that bodily exercise, it profits little. But godliness, godliness, that's where it's at. Godliness. The Bible tells us to walk godly. What does godly mean? You know, I hear people quote Timothy. They, they quote like, you know, 2 Timothy 3 and, and about the last days and this. And it says people will be lovers of themselves, not lovers of God, lovers of pleasure, this, that, and the other thing. You know, disobedient to parents, all that. And it says, and having a form of godliness, they deny the power thereof. Do you think that he's just talking about the miraculous there? Having a form of godliness is being able to, to know what God's word says, but never having it practically applied to your life because of Holy Spirit relationship. Do you know that we're in, we're in, such, we're in such a place in the body of Christ right now that people are calling good evil and evil good? Do you know that there's demonic doctrine out there called grace? And it's perverting the very truth of what godliness means. Listen, you know why I like talking about this? I do. Because I'd rather tell you now than you go to hell for believing it later. That's not legalism. That's love. Oh, I have a love relationship with my king. Why would I take Jesus' face, wipe it in the mud, and say, there's my king? What are we thinking? Come on. Do you know why people don't like the Beatitudes? Because it's impossible for you to walk them out in your flesh. That's why. <laughs> Do you know there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus? Watch this. There's more. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Could it be possible to live according to the Spirit? Would it be possible that to be led by the Spirit is to be a son? Could it be possible to live by the Spirit? The Bible says to cut off your hand if it, calls you to, if it causes you to sin. Here's my question. Could your hand cause you to sin if your mind didn't tell it to? Listen very carefully here, guys. Could my hand make me sin without my mind thinking a thought to have it do it? Could the disconnect be here and not here? The Bible says to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. The Bible says don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says that who can know the thoughts of the Lord? His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. The New Testament in Corinthians says, but we have the mind of Christ. Could it be a lack of an understanding on what we really have? 
See, false grace slips in because there's no relationship there. But the miraculous is prevalent. So I can still heal the sick and live in condemnation and live in twistedness and have a whole bunch of junk in my closet. But if righteousness is pursued, you can't even live with yourself living in that place. And it's a violation to love. And the love of God, the perfect love of God, casts out all fear. Here's where the fear is in that place. The perfect love of God casts out all fear. It says, having boldness to approach the throne of grace in time of need. I have boldness and confidence to approach the throne of grace, right here. I have boldness to approach the throne of grace in time of need. And when's the last time you didn't need Jesus? Is it possible that there is a lack of a position in the body of Christ for this place? And there is a huge place in the body of Christ for this place. Sometimes in life we're not noticed and we need to be noticed. So then we find out a gift is available, we start to walk in it, and we think that's our identity, so we start to get known by our gifts, because your gift will make room for you. But the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. There is a place in the love of God to live in a constant place of repentance every day, to where my conscience remains soft, pure, clean, and holy. To where I cannot, I cannot be outside of that, or it's outside of relationship. So in my life, it's been established in relationship, in the secret place. When I came out of Teen Challenge, I had Dan Moeller as like the guy that you would call your spiritual dad. But here's what happened. He was the guy, the first guy. He was like, he's like, I, I, I saw Jesus. I was like, man, dude. I came out of Teen Challenge. I'm so excited. I'm like, woo, God wants to heal people. Oh my gosh, I'm going to pray for everybody. So I just went outside of the church and prayed for it all a lot. And two weeks, she's like, I'm out. In other words, she wasn't going out of the house. And she didn't. For eight and a half months, she made me do all the shopping and everything. She went, you are an embarrassment. But I said to Dan, I said, dude, she won't even go shopping with me. She just doesn't understand. Huh? She will. It's okay. You pray for her. I said, all right. Man, you're my spiritual father. I'll listen to anything you're saying. Todd, I know what you're saying. It sounds right. It does. There's a way that seems right to a man. And I want to explain to you what I mean. I said, what? Because there's a lot of spiritual father talk. And I'm not against it. Here's what he told me. He said, Todd, if you don't understand that God's your father, you'll be an orphan. And I said, well, what do I do? He said, seek your father in the secret place. He showed me Matthew 6. And I went, all right. I said, well, then you're my mentor. <laughs> That's the best thing, the next best thing. <laughs> and he said, Todd, it sounds right what you're saying. And I thought, but it's not, is it? <laughs> This doesn't mean that we don't have mentors and spiritual fathers. That just, this just means that if you bypass God as a father and the Holy Spirit as your mentor, you'll be in trouble. And you'll be codependent upon somebody instead of co-laboring with somebody. And so what happened is he told me, if you don't seek God as your father, you'll always think you're an orphan. Because there'll be a time when you call me and I'm not available. You'll be like, oh my gosh. And you have to call somebody else to get to them. He said, you can glean from me and learn from me and I'll be here for you. As much as I possibly can. But you need to establish in your heart, God is your father. Because the Bible says in Matthew, call no one on earth your father. For you have one father. And I said, well, what about the mentor thing? He said, Todd, if the Holy Spirit doesn't become your mentor, you'll be in trouble. The Bible says, call no one on earth your teacher. For you have one teacher. So in the beginning of my life, he pushed me, forced me into my prayer closet to establish God as my father and the Holy Spirit as my mentor. That doesn't make me a lone ranger or, dis, or oh, disengaged from the body of Christ. That just makes me have a personal relationship with my father to where I can be in the secret place, read and say, oh my gosh, Lord, really? This is amazing. God, thank you. Oh, see right now, even right now, just when I think about it, he loves me so much, there's never been a question of whether he loves me. Like, he loves me. Like, really loves me. Every day, all day, he never changes. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. 
It's, it's revealed the love of God's been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It says that when we were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. See, when I came into this thing, do you know that Jesus didn't just pay a price because you were such a horrible sinner? He paid a price because sin was an issue. But something underneath of that sin was of great value, or heaven wouldn't have paid such a high price for you. So he pays a price to bring you up out of the muck and the miry clay. And he cleanses you and washes you and he cleanses you of all unrighteousness. And he, and he says that you're a brand new creation, that old things have passed away, that all things become new. The problem with me is that when I read it, I believe it. And if there's something I have a question about, I can call and ask. But man, I am telling you right now, take this from a 10 year old. I promise that the Holy Spirit will answer every question that you have if you would just trust in God to give you it. That doesn't mean don't have friends, don't have people that can help you, don't glean from people. That doesn't mean don't do, that doesn't mean don't glean from people, that means you can glean from people. That doesn't mean avoid teachers because it's one of the fivefold gifts in the ministry. That just means that if the Holy Spirit doesn't become your teacher, you might be swayed by every wind of doctrine thinking that it's truth. And you have the anointing that teaches you all things that are true. There is no darkness in him. There is, no li- there is nothing but light in him. He is light. And he says that we've become light in the Lord. Are you guys with me? Is this making any sense at all? We have to have personal... If I took a, a toll, a poll of hands, of how many people are in the Word every day, learning from Holy Spirit, it's very slim, all over the world. And, and it's a dilemma that I believe can be remedied. I believe it because the blood of Jesus never coagulates it's still the same still crying out still mercy listen it's really that simple man it's that simple all you gotta do is ask ask and you will receive do you know what that word means ask and keep on asking well that means ask well I already asked I never got it so I asked somebody else be very careful I'm not promoting independency I'm I'm promoting dependency upon father listen if you don't get this what you'll do is you'll go from church to church to church and you'll try to find love at a church and what you'll do is instead of finding love you'll find fault for a while it'll be okay but then you'll find fault they're just like everybody else who go to another one it's twisted so what happens is we we go to church to see if they'll love us Because we don't realize that we're already loved. So what you're supposed to do is find out what God says about you. And when you become a part of a local body, see, you you find love here. Here's where you find love. This is it, right here. I read the Bible, oh my gosh. And, and, And it hits my heart and I can't even explain what it means. But it does something inside of me, man. And then later, boom, you find love in this place. And then when you become part of a church, what you do is you've already become love. You just plug in. But if you go from church to church to church to find love, you're in trouble. You'll just find fault. Then you'll establish your own, like, home group Bible wound licking club. It's demonically inspired to keep you separated from the body of Christ. Because you'll think, nobody sees things my way. What are you thinking? Jesus is the way. God died for his girl. What are we thinking? That's a really good word right there, buddy. I felt a lot of people say, why did we come here? Hey, listen, if the shoe fits, kick it off. I'm not against cell groups and home groups, they're amazing. But man, if you've just been hurt by churches, you'll get like gathers like, and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of hurting people. They talk about their wounds. Well, they hurt you. Well, listen to what they did to me. And then every week is about your escalation of your hurt. When are we going to be free? When the sun sets us free. If I walk in the light as he is in the light, we can have fellowship. If I don't walk in the light as he is in the light, we cannot have fellowship. Because you know what we have? 
We have junk in our closet. Listen, if we don't walk in the light as he is in the light, we cannot have koinonia. We cannot have fellowship. I will keep you at arm's distance because I can't let you get close to me because I've got junk that you might find out. And all of a sudden, I, I walk like this and I can't allow anybody in because if anybody gets close, they'll see the real me. What if the real you would just step forward, dude? What if you just get into the place where saying, Jesus, here I am, all in. I'm tired of living for me. I want all of you. I mean, all God's asking you for is something you were never created to be in the first place because God did not create you for you. He created you for Him. So all He's asking you to do is to give up something you were never made to be. You were never made to be selfish and arrogant and all about you. You were never made to be self-seeking and envy. That stuff came through the fall. It's everything evil is in that place. It's the wisdom of man. It's sensual and demonic. It's self-seeking and full of envy. Envy could be as simple as this. Todd, what I wish I had your life. The only reason you say that is because you don't know who you are. Because God only made one of me and one of you. If you find out who God says you are, you'll be thankful for the life he gave you. And then you'll live in a life of thankfulness. And you'll blaze a trail of what thankfulness looks like. And your thoughts will never become futile. And twisted. It says it in Romans. It talks about, it talks about God. And they didn't glorify him as God. And they used people, they glorified people, they glorified figures, animals, statues, things, at the cost of who he was. And they, they, thankfulness left their life. If you're in envy, you absent thankfulness, because you're envying, you're coveting somebody else's stuff. You're coveting someone else's life. You can't afford to do that, you have to see who God created you to be. I don't have anything else to talk about except identity. I believe that we can actually be holy as he is holy. I believe we can. I believe that I live it. And if God convicts me, I step into wherever the conviction was. And I obey immediately. I'm a son. I know my father's voice. He says, my sheep. I'm a sheep too. He says, my sheep will, will obey my voice. And as strangers, they will not follow. Today if, you, today, if you would hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. It's not about rebellion. It's about submission. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. The resistance of the devil is in your full-on submission. It, 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 you have to full-on submit, full-on surrender. Say, God, I was about me. I was selfish. I was about my things. About waking up every day thinking that, man, I hope today's better than yesterday. Looking for me, myself, and I. Instead of submitting and surrendering to what the Word says at the cost of the lies that I'm living in. I can't afford to live a lie anymore, God. Here I am on my knees. Father, reveal this to me. I want to know you. Yeah. It would be terrible to stand before God and having done all these miracles and prophesied amazingly brilliant prophecies and stand before the Father and Him say, away from me, I never knew you. It's not okay. There's a difference between you saying you know God and being known by the Father. Yeah. Intimacy is where you know that you're known. See? Sometimes we think that he doesn't see what's going on, but he sees everything. Nothing's hidden. It says that he judges the thoughts and intents of your heart. You know what that means? Let me paint a picture for you. That means that God sits in the theater of my soul. And he watches everything that comes across my screen all day long. Every day. And my father likes what he sees in my soul. And that means a lot to me. That means everything to me. That's where my life is. I live a life pleasing to the Father, not because I have to, but because I get to. It says, pursue peace and holiness, for without which nobody will see the Lord. What does that mean? That means without which nobody will see the Lord. And they're supposed to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, your whole body's full of light. But if the light that is in you is darkness, and we can't afford to have darkness, where your treasure is, your heart will be. When I am focused in lack and wondering when I'm going to get this, all of a sudden I'm, I'm trying to lay up for myself treasures here. Where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. But man, I'm supposed to lay up for my treasures there. Treasures there where moth and rust can't destroy, thieves can't break in and steal. For where my treasure is there, my heart will be also. You cannot serve two masters. You can't. Man, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. 
But it's the lack of it sometimes that we don't believe, we don't trust our Father. We have to know our Father. We have to get into the bedroom, open your Bible and say, God, here I am. Jesus started the Beatitudes out with this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are. Man, that word blessed means happy are. Happy are those that are poor in spirit. That means that they're not spiritually arrogant and think they know it all. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that soul can never be satisfied but with more of me, with the reality of who I say they are. Blessed are those that pursue it in everything they are. Everything, at the cost of everything. See, in my life, nobody was with me. Nobody would stand with me. That doesn't separate me from God. My family wasn't with me. They weren't for it. They were against it. But God was for me. And my wife didn't know any better. My war's not against my wife. Your war's not against people. People aren't your problem. You are. People aren't your issue. You have a love that the Father has bestowed on us. What great the love, what great a love the Father's bestowed on us. What great a love. We can't afford to be in a love deficit, man. We can't afford to depend on love, but we need it here. It's not about here. People are looking for love in all the wrong places, man. Looking to be satisfied by, by this, at the cost of this. We need to roll with the love of God. We need to walk with the love of God. We need to speak with the love of God. We need to sleep with the love of God. If you don't fall asleep in the love of God, you will hug your pillow, God. You will thank God that your day is over. And that's the only thankfulness that comes. Thank you, God. I'm, I'm glad today's over. I hope tomorrow's better. And then you can barely get to sleep, only to hear the alarm clock in the morning. Ah! Uh, no pillow, God. No. And you have to hug your pillow. Because you can't believe you've got to leave it again for another day. You start your day off on the wrong side of the bed. What are we thinking? What is the wrong side of the bed? What is the wrong side of the bed? What is that? It's all about you. It's selfishness. God, I hope today's better than yesterday. Because man, if today's not better, my boss is a jerk, my people are mean. Jesus, you know what? Every time I read the Bible, it tells me that the rapture's coming someday. I hope you'd hurry it up because I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> my family's a jerk, my people are mean to me, and I really am. You know what? I can't even pay my bills. God, if you cared about me, you'd send Jesus right now to heaven with me and to hell with everybody else. <laughs> it's the truth. Life is a gift. It's a gift. And when you get born again, you get refathered. And now you're to be an example in this world of what it looks like for someone to get squeezed. Trials happen all the time. They're constant. They never stop. Trials, trials are necessary. It's the only way Christian maturity is built. But you know what? If you're on fire and you go in the fire, you're okay. If you're on fire and you get put in the fire, you're all right. You'll come out with a crisper, sharper, more awareness of His presence. A more crisper, sharper, more awareness of your Father's love. Man, the fire's not the issue. Bring it. That's good. Wow! Yeah! Trials aren't the issue. The only way to maturity is trials, man. The only way to grow is fire. It doesn't happen any other way. I wish it was different, but it's not. He set it up that way and it's good. You should make the devil wish that he never touched you. Come on, man. See, he's not afraid of us. He needs to. He's deadly afraid of Jesus. See, he's not afraid of you coming to church. Do you understand that? He's not afraid of you coming to conferences. You know what he's afraid of? You ever getting alone with God and believing what God says about you. He's deadly afraid of that. Because if you become a believer, that means one that is fully convinced. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, nobody can take this thing from you. Heaven paid such a high price to redeem your value. Your value before the Father. You are valuable to God. You are a little Christ-like one. A Christian. Man, if we'd see this thing. 
our workplaces will be turned upside down for the kingdom. Upside down. What a joy it is to live with Jesus. What a joy it is to represent Him at our job. Man, I worked. I loved it. Every time I went to work, Jesus came with me. I didn't leave it at my house. And I didn't pray to my pillow. No, no. I got off the bed. Oh my God, thank you. It's still the same today. I wake up. My wife says I got two speeds, high and off. Because I wake up and I'm like, hey, how you doing? Oh. He loves me. I believe it. Fully. Full on. Freight train for the kingdom of heaven. The devil takes a risk when he touches you. If you would see what I'm talking about, you wouldn't be afraid of being touched, man. Christianity is not a roller coaster ride, man. We say mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. John the Baptist said every mountain, every valley. What if that's the truth? Well, pray for me, I'm in a valley. Well, which one? And what has you there? The Israelites were in the wilderness. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Let me tell you what keeps us in that place, man. Let me tell you what keeps us in the wilderness. Do you know what it says today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts, it's in the day of rebellion. And it talks about 40 years, and it talks about how they, they knew His works, but they didn't know His ways. Right? Do you know that that bread that came down every morning was outside of their tent? Every day was outside of their tent. They wanted it seasoned. They wanted it fried. They wanted it something different. Maybe something. Maybe leek and onions. At least we had that stuff back in Egypt. I mean, come on, man. Can we have something different than bread? Do you know what they did? They loathed the worthless bread. Do you know that Jesus was the bread that came down from heaven? Do you know that Jesus was the living bread? Do you know that what they did was they said, you know what? This bread isn't enough. Jesus isn't enough for us, God. Do you know that rock that followed them around through the desert that kept, them, that kept their thirst quenched for 40 years? That rock was Christ. And out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. But what if Christ isn't enough for you? What if Jesus isn't enough for you? What if the raw truth of the gospel, the simplicity that's in the Christ, the finished work, what Paul said, I dare not talk about anything else but Christ and Him crucified. I dare not boast in anything. Paul was a scholar of scholars and said, I count all that as dung for the sake of knowing him. And he knew him. But it was this process of getting to know him more. It was this full joy. Full joy. Every day. Oh, that I might know him more. Beaten, broken, battered, bloody, whipped, stoned to death. Man, what a joy. The disciples got whooped the first time. And they counted it a privilege to get stomped on for Jesus. It's just a different mindset. We need to return to the simplicity of the gospel. Because that's all they had. Sometimes we honor a book that they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have. But the Holy Spirit's the only one that reveals the book. If you're going to read it, don't read it without Him. He wrote it. Every day, every day it's the same. I'm in the hospital with that nurse. She said, oh, that was awesome. I've been a Christian 30 years. I said, wow, I'm a Christian. This is like five and a half months for me. She goes, oh, honey, I knew that you were new. And I went, what do you mean? She goes, oh, I've been around for 30 years, you'll see. And I didn't know any better at all. And it wasn't being arrogant, nothing. I said, what well, did Jesus change? <laughs> I wasn't being mean. I didn't have any grid for it, any understanding for that. I didn't even know that that existed. And I said, well, he didn't, she got mad at me. Oh, no. Oh, you'll see. Oh, you just don't know. See, you and she gave me all these different excuses and none of them were valid. They were all about her. They were all about her missed stuff, her people that were mean to her, people that had passed away. All this different stuff she allowed to separate her from the love of God. All that stuff. And none of them will stand before you and the Father. One day you're going to find out when you stand before Him that it was all about you. <laughs> you're going to stand before Him and He's going to say, you know what? Well, you'll know before He even says anything because it will be all revealed. But why not know it now? Why not? It, it says, let go. 
let go of the sin and the stuff that so easily ensnares us. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect such great a salvation as this? People are depending upon you to walk like Jesus, man. They're dying every day. People are going to hell every day. It's time that we just say, that's it. That's it. I'm done. God, I want you, and that's it. That doesn't mean turn your back on your family. That just means get on your knees before your father. You guys okay? All right. Okay, because i got to open the book. You ready? Okay. There's a couple of words that, a couple of the scripture verses in what I've already shared. Chapters. Oh. Let's just read it all. Oh my goodness, man. Go to Second Timothy. Please, two. They should make an application on the phone that the pages turn. <laughs> Second Timothy two. Man, right before service the other day, I was reading Jude. That's a heavy book, man. Did you ever read it? Woo! That thing's fire. Oh my goodness. Read that one one time. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that one to you. It says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. For no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And if anybody competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. I just love it, man. It's so personal. For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain, that they, may, that they also may obtain the salvation, salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. For this is faithful saying, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to, ru to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun idle and profane babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, that they may overthrow, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this feel, having this seal, I'm sorry. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everybody who names the name of Christ, the Lord, depart from iniquity. But in a house there's also, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anybody cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Avoid foolish disputes 
or foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been ta- captive to do his will. They've been taken captive to do his will. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everybody that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Flee youthful lust. I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Be strong in grace. (sighs) Walking in the light as he is in the light. Living in the midst of a generation. It says, rightly dividing the word of truth so that you're not ashamed. The only way to be not ashamed of the gospel is that righteousness gets revealed to you. Because righteousness makes us unashamed. I am unashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. First for the Jew, then for the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel. What's the power of it? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the unashamedness of the gospel, the rightly dividing the word of truth, it has to be divided in truth by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he says that the word of God is alive, sharp, and active. Right? Just bear with me, okay? I'm just kind of bringing things together into this chapter. I I don't read things out of context. I don't do one-liners. When you hear me quote a one-liner and put it together, it's because I've read before and after. I'll never do that. You can make the Bible sound like what you want to make it sound like the other way, and that's twisted. But this Bible goes together, and it's line upon line, precept upon precept, but it's all about Jesus. They loathed the worthless bread. That bread was Christ. That rock that they hit, and water came, that Moses hit, and that water came out of it, that rock that followed them around the desert, that was Christ. Jesus is the living bread. Unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you can't be a part of this. That doesn't just mean communion. That means that your whole life is His. That your whole life is His. Do you know that when, you, when the gospel becomes part of your life, all of a sudden you're the source of water for people that thirst around you. People that don't even know they're thirsty. When people saw Jesus, they knocked on His door. When people saw Jesus, they followed Him for days without food. And Jesus multiplied the bread. When the gospel becomes who you are, Paul said it's my gospel. That means that it was so personal to him that everywhere he went, he was a representative. What does it mean to represent Jesus? That means that your life becomes living bread. That means that everywhere you walk, it doesn't mean people eat you. But that means that you are the bread. You are the bread of Jesus. You are His flesh and His blood. You are little Christ-like ones. Living water. Jesus says, out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. That means that the rock. What is the rock? Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church in the gates of hell. The church in the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is the rock? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Come on. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say this and some say that. And some, why? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but who do you say I am? I'm not touching that one. I don't know. Peter's like, you're the Christ? (laughs) God says, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my father did. Blessed are you. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. That's what he said. So the rock wasn't Peter, but the rock was the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the foundation? He who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house upon the, what's the rock? The revelation of Jesus Christ. When you, are, when you are grounded and seated with this thing right here in your soul, it's unshakable. 
When you study the word through the lens of righteousness, God says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be, they shall be filled. Then he said, blessed are those that are persecuted for the thing that they shall be filled with. <laughs> Do you know that right now, I preach righteousness, I preach right standing with God. I've gotten more persecution over this one right here than anything, so I know I'm on the right one. Oh, I promise. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Why? Because there's, man, listen, we're in a day and age right now that you better shift your pursuit right now. Shift everything. Shift everything. There are people around you that are going to hell, man, and they're watching your life. They're watching your life. They want to wonder. They're wondering, like, who's the real Jesus? Like, what is the real Jesus? We need to have the rock, the foundation, because the firm foundation of God still stands. The Lord knows those that are His. And that everybody that names the name of Christ must depart. Doesn't say kind of depart. Doesn't say should kind of maybe depart. When they feel like they're ready, they should depart. Maybe sometime God's working on me. Man, time is short, buddy. We're, we're around our last lap. We're running our last lap. You'll be persecuted for it. He says this. Hey, should you know? We endure the suffering. What's the suffering? Is the suffering for doing bad? Or is the suffering for doing good? Blessed are those that suffer for righteousness sake. Suffering for doing good. In other words, I'm living one with my king. I'm running full on, full steam. There's no junk in my closet, dude. I don't have any issues. I'm in love with Jesus. I kneel before him every day. He knows my heart. My heart knows him. I am known by my father. I wake up squeaky clean. Every day I've lived without twistedness for 10 years. Every day. I've never had any condemnation, guilt, or shame. Why is that so far-fetched? Why is that so far out there? Maybe we need to shift our focus to pursue righteousness. Because he said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything will be added to you. What if we've sought stuff instead of him? What if we sought stuff? What if we sought reading the Bible at the cost of, of asking God to reveal it? The kingdom of God isn't meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom is in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness says it's, it's, not, it's not meat or drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Your joy comes from the reality of being right with God. Your joy comes from your salvation. My joy comes from being right with my dad. There are people around you every day wondering, wondering if you really believe what you say you believe. And your actions speak louder than your words. You can say a lot of things, but if your life doesn't line up with it, what do you really got? You got words, you got lip service. You can't afford to honor God with your lips, but your heart be far from Him. Are you with me? Listen. I want to share a couple of testimonies that come out of this realm right here. I'd love to expand on it a little bit more. I've had you for a long time. I was on a plane. I have a lot of airplanes and stuff that I ride on because I do like 300,000 miles a year. That's a lot of planes. So I was going to Argentina. I was on my way down there, I was leaving from Houston, and I get on the plane and I'm like, I always talk to as many airline attendants as I can, because they're not, sleep, they're not sleeping when everybody else is, so I, I talk to everybody, dude, like, you just, everybody, I talk to people around me on the plane, everywhere, everywhere I go, I am revival, no, I, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I don't, like, try to, like, figure out where do you want me to go, God. I just go, and he comes with me. I'm, I'm like, it's not complicated. To me, everybody's a target for the love of God. Everybody. But not everybody wants to be a target. Trust me. What are you going to do then? It's easy to talk to people that love you back. What about the ones that don't know how to? If you don't have this thing grounded in your heart... You only do the easy stuff. You know the reason why we don't like family reunions? 
It's because we've talked about Christ and they just don't want to hear it, so we stop sharing it. So we feel bad about going there and bringing it up, so we don't. Well, I can't live that way. But we've had some serious, serious family reunions, haven't we? Oh. <laughs> I'll never stand before God and answer for anybody's life. Ever. Ever. I will not walk and be silent. I will not put a basket on my head. I will not. People are going to hell, man. It ain't going to happen. And I'm not going to walk like the devil and confess Jesus. Call it grace. I'm not. God have mercy on these people. God have mercy on them. The miracles aren't what validates you as a son. The cross does. It's the finished work of Christ. It's the reality of it. It's finished. It is finished where God tore the veil so that we could enter into the presence beyond the veil. We need the blinders taken off. We need the veil removed. Because the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And where He's not, there isn't. But since He lives in you, why not be free? We all with unveiled face beholding us in a mirror. We're looking in the mirror. We're seeing our identity. We're seeing Christ in us. The hope of glory. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Christ in us. The hope of glory. He's in there. Or being transformed into what? Transformed back into the original image that God created me to be in the beginning as if I never ate the tree. God looks at me as if I never sinned. That's living pure. My heart is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why? Because when I look in the mirror, I see God staring back at me. He likes to live here. He set it up that way. He chose me. I didn't come up with this plan. I was, this worst, I was the worst of the worst. And God said, I want that one. And he took me up out of the muck. And he cleaned me off. And he washed me internally. And he told me to be strengthened in my inner man for the rest of my life. And he told me to believe me, son. Believe that you are who I say you are. Now I'm taking you into two commandments, Todd, and these are those. I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the second one's like it, Todd. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself, but you'll never love your neighbor unless you know who you are. So you press into this because I've created you in my image. And in the image of God... He made man. Jesus restored that which was lost. Now the difference is I don't walk with God. I walk with God in me. I have relationship with my father. He chose this. He set up his camp inside of me. He likes to live here. He does. He likes it there. He chose me. That's crazy awesome. I'm serious. I walk by mirrors and go, oh my gosh, I see you. I'm in an airplane. Open the door. Look in the mirror. Oh. I wake up in the mirror, I brush my teeth. God, today someone's going to give love to me. I live that way. I go to sleep with peace every day. He gives his beloved rest. I rest in him. The blood of Jesus has ceased from my works, ceased from my striving. I enter in, I stay there. It's not a one-time altar call, it's a life. It's communion. The love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the communion with the Holy Ghost. And I live in that place in love with my dad. People are like, you're whacked. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says to be a peculiar people. That's me. That's you. So I get on this plane. I'm almost done. I hope that you're getting something out of this. Because we're going to ask God to drive this thing into your heart, man. <laughs> Remember Bruce Lee? He was awesome. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm passionate, man. I just love Jesus. I've been free for 10 years. This is what it looks like. I'm a mess, okay? I'm in love with Jesus, man. I am not afraid. And people are like so afraid of ISIS. I'm not afraid. <laughs> they need Jesus, dude. You don't understand. They need Jesus, man. Well, look at what they're doing. Well, I get it. They need Jesus. That's what they need. They need Jesus, man. So I'm on the plane. I get on there and I'm telling everybody about Jesus. We're not taking off yet. I, I've told like three attendants that God loves you so much. You guys are amazing, man. Thank you so much for what you do. I fly a certain airline, so I talk to them all the time, man. 
I do. I thank them. They're like, oh, well, great. That's great. Okay. They're kind of uh huh me because there's other people around that can hear me talking about Jesus. I drop in the J bomb. on a plane <laughs> I don't have anything else to talk about dude I don't have football to talk about I don't have baseball to talk about Christianity is a full contact sport dude I just I'm one track minded I mean you can play it's cool but talk about Jesus when you're playing and if he tells you to turn the game off and visit with him don't like say well wait a minute Lord I'll be with you in a second if you're watching your game all right I won't mess with that one too much. <laughs> Don't mess with my idols, dude. <laughs> Chill. <clears throat> I don't like this guy anymore. <laughs> he talked about my Sunday night. I was just hanging out with Seahawks last week. Amazing. <laughs> oh. Jesus is going to do amazing things. Ah. I got to go work out in their VMAC, in their, like, their big like, training place facility out in Seattle with the Seahawks. We're like, me arms little, your arms big. Sorry. <clears throat> so I'm telling everybody about Jesus. We get up in the air. I tell the guy beside me. He doesn't want to hear it. He puts his finger over his face. But we're going to be on the plane for like 13 hours. So <laughs> he's not going to sleep like that the whole time. I've been screamed at before. I'll be screamed at again. You ain't gonna kill me because I'm never gonna die. Oh, I'm so serious, dude. To live is Christ and to die is gain. If the fear of death is in you, or if you're worried about how you're gonna look in front of people, you can't live the gospel. You'll always compromise it for somebody. Forget that, dude. All in. <clears throat> so I'm telling them I prayed for two attendants. Jesus healed them, touched them. They're Christians, silent, kind of 007. Christians serious on a mission I just like I just don't understand it all I just I need to live a life that's worthy of the call that doesn't mean to like be seen by everybody that just means that I'm not ashamed of the gospel man in every situation I'm gonna bring Jesus up I love being around Reinhardt man you're at a table and everybody's having dinner you know and he'll just sit there and he'll be eating and people will be talking do you know what I think like, it's like do you remember Lion King with Mufasa? <laughs> I'm serious. Reinhardt speaks out by this. <laughs> he brings everything to Jesus, man. Every time. Doesn't matter what conversation you're in. Every time. He doesn't have anything else to talk about. That's how I want to live. Every time. People get tired of hearing it. Man, it's not always about Jesus. Oh, yes it is. <laughs> you turn everything around. It's awesome. So we, we're, I'm praying for people. God's touching people. We've been on the flight for a long time. I have had an amazing time with Jesus. And I go up front. It's the end of the flight. We're coming down. We're about 45 minutes from the place. No, 35. Yeah, because we're about to go into the final descent. And there was one lady that I didn't get to. Because she's up front. She's the cook. And I've got to tell her. So I walk up front. And I'm like, hey. I'm like, I didn't get to talk to you. I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you. She's a flight attendant at 5 in the morning. She says, don't preach to me. Get out of my face, she says. Screams at me on a plane. I mean, it was like. <laughs> and people were sleeping. It was loud. It was in the front of the plane. All the business people. They were like. I went, hey, she goes, oh, just get away from me now. She's just yelling at me. I'm like, all right, hey, hey. I went in the bathroom. Washed my hands. Not from her. <laughs> went in the bathroom, looked in the mirror. 
And the Lord spoke to me. He says, confront her now. That doesn't happen. Not like that. Hardly ever. It's only happened a couple of times in my life. But the fear of the Lord is bigger to me than ever having any. That's like it. That, that answers it right there. So I don't even have, I don't have anything to go with. I don't even know what to say. So like he just says, confront her. So I'm not going to go out there, let me tell you something. That would be wrong. That's not what he said. That would be, that would be your attitude. It's not about an attitude. We don't need that attitude. So I came out of the bathroom and the flight attendants were all, there's five of them up there and sh they saw me coming. I just turned the corner and went up there. I said, hey, excuse me, ma'am. They were like, oh, they were like gripping stuff. I said, you yelled at the wrong man today. She goes, oh, really? Real loud. And right away, the Lord told me that she lost her father at nine years old to cancer. And she's blamed me ever since. She has a devil. And I said to her, I said, you lost your father to cancer when you were nine years old. And now you've taken it out on me and you've blamed the father for that. She says, Ugh. and she started growling and her eyes rolled up into her head. On the plane. In front of all the attendants. <laughs> you. Real. Real. She's not my problem. That thing is. So what are you going to do? Jump on top of her? <laughs> do you know what the other flight attendants are thinking right now? Do you have any idea? Like her eyes go. <laughs> what do you think they're thinking? She's having a seizure. Something's happening here. Sir, go back to your seat. I can't afford to go back to my seat right now. It wouldn't be a good time. We have to finish it. So I said, I said, this thing's leaving you right now. And I stepped towards her. She fell into me. She goes, I need you right now. I need you right now. She's crying. And the other flight attendants are like, oh my God, what do we do? I said, nothing. Just stand there. In the name of Jesus, you leave now. And she fell into me. And I started talking to her, telling her that God loved her. And she's sitting there holding my shirt, grabbing it, snot and tears, crying. Because Jesus is setting her free. Because there's somebody on the plane that doesn't, that's not afraid. There's somebody on the plane that doesn't have sin in his life. That doesn't have twisted stuff in his life. That has confidence to approach the throne of grace in time of need. There's somebody on the plane that doesn't have junk in their closet. I don't have twisted stuff. I don't have skeletons. I don't have issues you're going to find out about. You're not going to read about me in the paper, dude. I'm clean in my heart and the only one. The Bible says that the bride has made herself ready in Revelation. That means that there is the making of the bride ready to where you submit to grace and truth because grace empowers us to walk out what truth calls us to. He comes in and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If you step into something, you confess to the Father and he cleanses you of all unrighteousness and the only thing that's left is righteousness. You can't afford to live in the other place, man. Your junk will find you out. You can't afford to live in that place. So valuable, man. She comes around the corner. I'm talking to her. Telling her how much God loves her. Praying for her. She gets born again. Just beautiful stuff right now. And all of a sudden, the head flight attendant goes, Sir, you need to go to your seat. I'm like, I understand. And he goes, no, no, look out the window. We're like 30 seconds from the ground. <laughs> I have to go to my seat. So I run to my seat, sit down, everybody's like, they're not even looking at me. These are people I talked to Jesus about. <laughs> they are like freaked out. They, don't, they're, they can't even believe they're on the plane with me, man. I'm so serious. You should see it. They're like, dude behind, beside me. I promise. I see it all the time. Do you know what a joy it is to see this all the time? Somebody's got to plow through. Somebody's got to run. Somebody's got to wake up and run. Why would we be afraid? Stop listening to the liar, man. Raise up with holy boldness and stomp hell for a living. Stop being manipulated by it. You were a slave to sin. Now you're an instrument of righteousness. You're a weapon for the Lord. You're not a slave to sin. 
Let sin no longer have dominion over you. Let it not even have dominion. The Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows that you're His. Now that you're His and He is yours. You've got everything according to life and godliness. Get in the book and say, God, I don't have a clue, but I want to. Here I am, God, send me. And then go to your workplace because that's your mission field. And bring Jesus. And stop crying about your job. Stop being bummed out about your job. Time to make the donuts. No, it's another chance for you to represent Jesus. It's not about you. It's about Him. Stop being bummed out about your work. Go to work and represent Jesus, man. Live full on. Yeah, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, do something. And burn with Jesus, man. Represent Him. Might not be the job you're going to do forever, but just do something. And then burn for Jesus, man. God will open doors for you. Don't try to open your own. Just get something and then represent. Your job won't be a bummer. You'll wake up in the morning, oh man, I'm going to work at McDonald's. You know what? Somebody's going to get Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Ask them if you can have the mic for the window. Man, what I would do for the mic in a window. I promise. Oh, ask my wife, how many times at, at the drive throughs have, I, have we been giving them Jesus? A couple of times. Every time. I don't have anything else to say. Yes, can I please have a chicken breast? And I'd just love to tell you that Jesus loves you so much. I would love it. Hi, McDonald's. This is Todd speaking. Jesus loves you so much. Can I take your order? <laughs> Boss says you can't say that. Man, I'm really sorry. I don't mean to offend you. Todd's speaking. They come to the window. How you doing? Do you know how much Jesus loves you? You're amazing. Hey, listen. I blessed your food before I put it in the bag today. Put a note in there. Happy meal. Come on, man. Boom. So, the plane ride was pretty crazy. We get to the thing, they're like, we got to get off this plane. You know, we land, the door opens, they're like, whew, filing out quick. I walk by them, I'm like, bless you guys, the head airline said, I am so sorry, man. I go, dude, I'm not going to complain, no one's getting in trouble. This was totally different than what you think it was. He's like, no, no, okay. So I leave, so I wait at the end of the gate, and waiting for them to come out. Because I need to talk to all of them. They won't come off the plane. <laughs> so I'm, I flew to Argentina for, 20, well, for 36 hours. 24 hours in, 36 hours there, 27 hours home. Man, I waited at the end of the gate, didn't get to. Got to go hang out with Carlos Anacondia, though. It was awesome. Just amazing. But anyway, I get back on my plane. I'm like, man, because I asked the Lord, I said, I really, really, really want to talk to them people again. You know, I get back on the plane, it's the same flight crew. How awesome is that? That's the Lord. Oh, do you, listen, you got to know this. When I came down the flight bridge, oh, when I came in there, I had my guitar on my back, you know, I came in, I'm like, hey, they're like, oh God. How awesome is that? I go, hey, oh man, I was praying that I'd meet you guys again. I so love you guys. I'm glad we have this long flight on the way home so we can talk. They're like, you want to get to your seat, sir? You know? I'm like, oh, I am, man, I, I can't sleep. I don't want to sleep. I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> This is real stuff. It happens every day. Ask my wife, dude. It's pretty insane. It's good. God's good. What would it be like for you to be free from you? This is what it would be like. What would it be like for you to go to work and not be afraid of what people are going to think about you anymore? Because you're too concerned about what he thinks about you. And when you know five thoughts that he thinks about you, you're possessed. What about a million? Oh. 
What about just the love of God? What about just that one thought right there? Oh, all your fears are like, <clears throat> out, dude. The devil tries to bring them. You laugh at that because you got this. The devil tries to lie to you. You got this. Why would you pay attention to that now that you got this? That's silliness. This is amazing. The devil whispers to you. You don't turn around and rebuke him. He's already behind you. You don't need to tell him to get behind you. He's already there. You be possessed with truth so that when the stranger speaks, this place is occupied. It says no vacancy on your forehead. Because it's possessed by truth. It's possessed by what God thinks about you. If you get possessed about, that's the whole Bible. It's set up to make you like Christ. You are to be an imitator of Christ. It's not about just you being free, a little free. It's about you being so free from you that you take on something that you didn't even deserve. Because grace is something you didn't deserve. But grace is also the divine inspiration of God upon your heart with His outward reflection of Himself upon your life. So that everywhere you go, God gets to... So here, I got two testimonies. This one and one small one. You alright? It's 10 o'clock. You okay? Charles is like, go ahead, dude. I love you guys. You get done before I do. Bless you. I love you. I do. I want to share this because the two testimonies talk about the same thing. And I just want to give what it looks like in action. That's all. Are you getting anything out of this? I just, I just, I want you to wake up like this. Go home like this. But wake up like this. Oh my God, it's true. Ah! That's what I want. Right there. You look in the mirror and be like, for real? Yes! You open your Bible, yes. Oh, yes. Guess what? It's yes. That's it right there, dude. Oh, I'm so for real. Just read it like a kid. Like, seriously, Dad? All right. Thank you. The devil says, you, thank you. The devil touches you again, pushes you closer to God. Touches you again, just pushes you closer to God. He takes a risk, man. If this thing possesses your soul when he touches you, he'll get Jesus all over him. Come on, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice. When you squeeze an orange and apple juice comes out of it, it's weird. When you squeeze a Christian and everything but Jesus comes out of you, it's weird. When you get squeezed, Jesus ought to come out everywhere. The devil ought to take a risk when he touches you because he gets Jesus on him and can't stand it. Trials. Perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope don't disappoint. My character's being built because I'm in trials, man. It's amazing. And I manifest my Father. And when patience has its perfect work in you, whew, you'll be complete lacking nothing. Yeah, but patience is a bummer. No, it's not. It's the first thing that love is. Love is patient. Patience isn't a bummer because love's not a bummer. Selfishness is a bummer because it's all about you. Righteousness is amazing because it's all about Him and you're right with Him. And if God is for you, who cares who's against you? Okay. So the head airline attendant comes up to me. And he goes, sir, he goes, I really do need to apologize. This is after we're off the ground and stuff. Comes back, he's real sober in his face. I said, what's up? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I, I said, no, I didn't complain. Man, it wasn't about that. He goes, no, she's, she's different now. She, he said, it's not that. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He goes, what, what ministry are you a part of? I said, dude, I'm just a Christian. I love Jesus, man. He goes, no, I, I can see that. But why, how how long have you been a Christian? I've been a Christian for 10 years. How, listen, he has tears. I need to say I'm sorry to you because you're a conviction to me. He said, there's two things I don't talk about. It's religion and politics. He said, and I said, well, I, I don't talk about either of them either, man. He goes, he goes, no, he goes, you know what? He goes, I get it. He goes, but your walk convicts me. And I knew what was happening, but I was too ashamed to talk about it. He goes, I'm going to tell you right now, as soon as you get off this plane, I called my wife and we repented. We repented because I know this is Jesus and this is how I should be living my life. So I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, but it'll never happen again. 
And I'm like, man, thank you for I just He walked away and I just started crying. I thought to myself, God, if only one person, if only one person. Because it says that we're there endure the suffering for the sake of the elect. What does that mean? There are elect all around you. And someone makes fun of you for being right with God. Someone persecutes you. Someone says some belittling things. And you respond in Christ. And instead of hitting them with a harsh word, they despitefully use you and you pray for them. Because the Beatitudes has become your attitude of being. And you bless those that curse you. You're not cursed because someone cursed you. You're blessed. Bless them back so it gets them. You can't curse me. I'm blessed. I won't get hurt by you. I haven't been hurt by somebody. It's been 10 years, man. I've hurt four people, but I've never been hurt by anybody. Is it possible to be hurt for, to hurt for somebody and never be hurt by them? Yeah, it is. If my king can hang on a tree and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Then why could I, why could I not look at somebody and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When I go through trials, I'm in fires all the time. People are not my issue. If I respond that way, it's because I'm still in the way. And I need to get out of the way so that God can have His way. And I need to see what is the way, and it's Jesus. Because we can't afford to know His works and not know His ways. God's ways are Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. He's the way to the Father, the truth of the Father, the life of the Father, and God says to be an imitator of that. There's some big sandals to fill, but Jesus says you can, but the only way to fill them is to submit, surrender, give up, and say, I'm in. Another flight attendant, same thing happened. Same plane. Amazing ride home. I was humbled off that plane. Off the plane, I just hugged them. Love you guys, man. Bless you. Huh. It was amazing. I had one more plane I want to tell you about. It was just, when did I come home? Monday. Yeah. <laughs> I was out in Seattle. We took off. This is powerful, man. Took off from the airport in Seattle at like 10.30 at night. We're headed across. About an hour, hour and 20 minutes into the flight, I see the airline attendants running back to the back. There's somebody, I'm, I'm, I got upgraded, so I'm up there in the eight business seats. I'm sitting up there, and the guy's back there, fall down, he's fall down, he's fallen down in the, in the aisle away, and another flight attendant is pinned underneath of him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got it. And, and, and before this happened, I've been talking to this medical student who's beside me. I get on the plane, I'm like, hey man, what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm a medical student. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, man. I, can't, I love medicine. And I'm telling this guy, so this is before this happened, as soon as we're going up in the air. And I said, man, I, I worship Jesus with all my heart, but I've seen some amazing miracles. Really? So I'm showing him some pictures of people that have, paralytics have gotten out of wheelchairs. Little sticks for legs carrying their wheelchairs up. Blind eyes that are open. He's like, really? That's great. How can this happen? I said, well, you got some stuff going on in your leg. Why don't you let me pray for you? He goes, Yeah? How do you know about my leg? I mean, Jesus lives in me, dude. He's a good physician. He goes, okay. All right. So I pray for him. I said, Father, I thank you that you fix his left shoulder too. God, I thank you. In Jesus' name. This is the person I'm on the plane beside. For however long I'm going to be there, they are a target for the love of God. They will not get away. Doesn't matter. You can't shut me off. You can't scream at me and make me be quiet. It's not going to happen. You will not make me uncomfortable. I've got the comforter. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm in elevators all, and doing this all the time. The elevator, short, the elevator door shut. Hey, guys, guess what? You're never going to believe this. God loves you so much. I am blessed to be in the elevator with you. Do you believe in Jesus? I have people in the door waiting to get out. And then I just elf the elevator. The gospel is good news. <laughs> so 
So I'm praying for this guy, and I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with him for about an hour. I should have said this before the other thing, because all you guys are like, what about the people in the aisle? <laughs> They're still there. They're not there yet in this story. So I'm telling this, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm sharing a witness. I, I'm not just, I don't do witnessing. I've become one. Jesus said, then you will be a witness. It's not about doing. It's about being. You be to do. It's not about what you have to do. It's about who you are. And out of your being, you do. That's why sonship is priority. Because if sonship is the priority and the miraculous comes as a byproduct of being, you're safe. Sonship is your priority and you're seeking the Father to understand who He is as a dad, understanding who you are as a son and a daughter. All of a sudden, relationship gets established. And when the miraculous happens out of that, you're still in sonship. But if the miraculous is pursued but your identity isn't secure, you will gain your identity through what you do instead of who God says you are. And you can't afford, you can never get into a twisted grace place if you're on your knees before your father reading the word and asking him to reveal all truth. Ever. You will not be swayed by every wind of doctrine. And you will not have itching ears and heap up for yourselves bunches of teachers so that you can be tickled. It's about the truth that's in God. Are you okay? So I'm... I'm I'm on the plane talking to the medical student and all of a sudden I see them guys run back and he's doing his chemistry stuff and I'm just reading the word crying. Like, God's so good to me. He loves me. I camp in the Beatitudes and I'm in the Beatitudes. I think Matthew 7, I think. I'm like, oh my gosh. And they keep running back and forth and they're stomping like louder than, like louder than airline attendants do. I didn't know what was going on for a while and then I look back and I see dude's feet like this in the aisle. And, and then all of a sudden... Is there, a medical, is there a medical doctor on the, on the plane? Is there anybody with medical experience? <laughs> a nurse and another nurse were back there already. And, and, and the airline attendant that's wrapped up in the wrong lifestyle is on there. He does not like God. He does not like Jesus. Doesn't like him at all. And I said, man, I said, can I go back there? Are you a doctor? Well, no, but the great physician lives inside of me, sir. I love Jesus. Oh, pfft. And he just kind of like blew me off, like literally. Pfft. And he walks back there. And I'm like, man. And, and what I can do is I can go, I'm actually thinking, I'm like, God, if, this, if, somebody's, if somebody died on the plane, they're getting raised today. No matter what happens, God. I, I'm not kidding, dude. I'm like full on this thing. Like I don't have a, a plan B here. I, I only have plan A. Plan A is Jesus, dude. Like, what would Jesus do isn't a bracelet. No, it's not. It's a life. So I, he comes back up. Now, two airline attendants are up there, and they're both against Jesus. Like, they're not happy. So he's coming up. Man, can I, please, will you let me go back and pray? Will you let me go? Sir, that is offensive to people. I said, I, it, it's not offensive. Honestly, it, Jesus will raise him right now. He'll get him up right now. If you just let me pray for him, God will get him up. Sir, I will pray with you right here. I said, then come on. He goes, I am not praying with you. And he walks away from me. And he's, I mean, he's really, really mad, dude. You have no idea. I mean, mad, like screaming mad. I am done talking about this. I asked him another seven times. Because I'm trying to honor. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful and the medical student is like, this is crazy. I go, yeah. He goes, why won't they let you go back there? My, my shoulder and my, and my ankle are healed. If they let you back there, you can do something about this. I said, why don't we pray for that guy right now, right here? So I prayed for the guy right now, right here. And he didn't get up right away. And I'm like, man. I'm like, can I please go back there, man? He's still not. Now we're like, we're turned around. They turned the plane around because the airline attendant's down. They can't fly the whole way without it a certain amount of air attendance, so they're going back to Seattle airport. So I'm like, man, I got, I'm like, my heart, everything I'm thinking, like, when he goes up front again, I'm dashing back there, I'm just going to pray for the guy. (laughs) I'm burning with a desire to see this guy get up. I, I, I think this way. So all of a sudden, the dude gets up, and he walks up to the bathroom, and the bathroom is right behind my seat, right behind the curtain. And I'm, I'm like, the nurse is there, and the guy's up front. I'm like, I gotta pray for him now. So I stand up and I went behind the veil, a little, just a little. And I said, I said, ma'am, can you please tell this man that I love Jesus with all my heart? And I really like to pray for him right now. And Jesus will heal him. She goes, okay. 
So the nurse tells him, there's a man out here that loves Jesus with all his heart. And he says that if he prays for you, Jesus will heal you. And so the guy didn't respond. So I put my head behind the door. I said, dude. He goes, what? I said, let me pray for you, man. He goes, what? What? Give me your hand, man. He gives me his hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command this thing to loose you. Just, just like this. What just happened? Like, complete. Watch this. The nurse goes, praise the Lord. The other EMT that's working with him is like, she's praying with me as I'm praying for him. She goes, this is awesome. I'm like, right? I turn around, the flight attendant is there. Oh, dude, listen to me. He is, he is so mad. I told you, stand down on the plane. Stand down, screaming at me. I went, dude. I just prayed for him. Jesus healed him. I don't care what Jesus did. Real loud, screaming. The nurse ain't going to take that. You know what the nurse, she goes, sir, you stand down. She said, I thought we were after this man's health and welfare. She said, he asked me if he could pray for him. And I asked this man. And this man said, yes. The man said, I said, yes. The airline attendant... Listen, the airline attendant looks at me, and he goes, I'm going to go tell the captain that you're insubordinate and disrupting the flight. I said, okay. Dude, I love you with all my heart. Jesus loves you. And he runs back up front, storms, dude, has the oxygen tank that doesn't need it now. So mad. I mean, he's so mad. The medical student is like, So I sit down in the seat with the medical student. See, he was a Christian, but like, just getting his feet wet. I said, the gospel's confrontational, man. He goes, I have never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> He's not the only one. I am the bad guy on the plane. But I'm suffering for doing good. And it's commendable before my father. And if I don't, somebody's going to hell. And I can't afford to go out that way, man. The airline attendant's up front. He's like in hiding, talking to the other one. They're like finding, figuring out how to get me. And what's he going to do? You can't kill me. You going to throw me off the plane? I'll just wait. Till, if the cops come on the plane when I get there, I'll go with them. I'll pray. I'll preach. To, uh, listen. <laughs> You have no idea. I've talked to lots of police about this thing. I have to tell them. I was the guy in the back seat. I mean, I've been extradited across America, in and out of prison my whole life. Kicked out of the Marine Corps. Just tragedy. I was in the back of so many cop cars, it's not even funny. And I tell them, man, if you'd know who you were in Christ, you could tell that guy in the back seat there's hope for him because I'm that guy. And I'd share with him. LAPD cussing me out. I still share the gospel. What are you going to do? You put me in jail for telling you about Jesus. I'm not going to get insubordinate and get in your face. I'm going to hold my hands behind my back and preach to you. Share the love of God. And God will heal you in your anger. Because he will. So I've watched him do it. I've watched him heal angry police officers. God's going to heal your right shoulder right now. Sir, step away. Okay. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I'm done with all that stuff. I'm gonna, then you can't. What are you gonna do? You lock me up, people in jail will get saved. You can't, you're, there's nowhere you're gonna put me unless I'm in solitary confinement forever. But I'm just gonna be in communion with God. So you can't do anything about this, man. Ever. Ever. I'm possessed by the kingdom. He loves me, he likes to get on people. He does this, this is just for me, this is for everyone, for all that would believe. You better not not believe. So, I said to the medical student, man, that guy's really mad. He goes, man, I've never seen, look, it's a good thing you're on this plane, huh? That guy's really better, isn't he? I said, yes, he is. So isn't Jesus amazing? Other people are listening to me, kind of like this. Everybody's ashamed. 
<laughs> I'm not ashamed, dude. See, somebody right now on that plane keeps thinking about what just happened. Right now, they, they, at night, I just pray that everybody gets infected with the reality of what they saw on that plane. Possessed by it. Where the Holy Ghost, boom, thumps their heart with a Holy Ghost defibrillator. Bap! <gasps> what just happened? Your son, run. So I'm talking to the med student, I go, we need to pray for that guy, man. He's in trouble. He goes, yeah, man, he's really angry. So he didn't pray. I said, Father, I just thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you'd overwhelm him, God, and show him who he is. God, he's your son. You love him so much. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to represent you, God. You're amazing. I thank you for my friend that I just met today. In your hand. Thank you for my friend <laughs> he just, that you just met, that helped me meet today, God, that he got to see what it's like to suffer for doing good. God, I thank you. You're amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. He goes, amen. The airline attendant comes walking back the aisle, comes to me, gets in my face. And he goes, sir, can you please forgive me? Oh, you, 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 this is like, this is the greatest. This is amazing. Can you please forgive me, sir? I said, I was never mad at you. No, you should be, but I'm not. I know your value, man. You're a son. Jesus loves you. He goes, I want to believe that. I said, man, believe, look at my eyes, man. He said, thank you, sir. He hugs me, kisses me on the cheek, hugs me. We won't let go. Airlines, in front of this medical student. I said, dude, God loves you so much, man. Thank you for saying you're sorry. But I'm not mad at you. And I'm not going to write you up, man. I'm not a complainer. Complaints aren't even in the Christian language. It's not even supposed to be named among me. I'm not a complainer. I'm a lover of God. And he loves you. Thank you, sir. And bless you too, sir. He's kind of hiding from me, the other guy. <laughs> People beside me are like, the medical student's like, dude. <laughs> I said, I wish I was as smart as you and I could understand chemistry, man. I said, but I know my father. It doesn't take a brilliant man to know that. All it takes is one that wants to know that he's a son. He goes, man, this is awesome. And he's a Christian. It was amazing. We get off the plane, but before we get off, the paramedics come on with a wheelchair. They walk back there and they get the flight attendant. That the one that lo- the guy fell on, I couldn't get the whole way to the back of the plane. But she has to roll by me. I said to the medical student, I said, dude, that lady's coming up. They're not letting us off until they wheel her up here. I said, you going to pray with me? He goes, no, you do it, man. <laughs> said, All right. <laughs> I was so serious, dude. Like, it is funny, but, like, these things happen every day. Like, they're yours, too. Just take them to Walmart, man. That was the first place it started with me. I was the Walmart testimony guy up here at this church. I come up and share testimonies at Walmart. Remember the dude that came up here? He was in the crowd. He had a torn shoulder, and I prayed for him, and his shoulder was healed. He came up and said, that's the dude that prayed for me in Walmart. Remember? That was, so, that was so fun. I used to lay on this floor right here, and I used to cry and lay there and worship Jesus on my face, and I still do, because he's so good. If you see this love, you'll never be the same. You'll never want to live for you. You'll never want to sin and get away with it. Grace is Jesus, and Jesus never tried to sin and get away with it. Jesus gave us a place to be free from sin, to let go of that stuff that easily ensnares us, and to run. The airline attendant goes by, and the paramedic, I said, dude, halt. (laughs) Yes, sir. I said, i got to pray for her real quick, okay? pray for her. Jesus, I thank you for this woman. Thank you, God, that she does all these miles. God, I fly so much on this airline. I thank you so much. I ask you to bless her, God. Make her whole. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Body be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. She said, thank you. And they roll past. The guy goes, medical student goes, dude, this is awesome. I said, this is Christianity, bro. I said, people don't understand it. He goes, how about that flight attendant? I go, yeah. I said, did you see what happened? He didn't want to do that stuff. He didn't want to yell at me. He was just trying to do his job. He got caught up. 
But if I go with everybody's attitude that's caught up, I'll be just like the world, man. I can't afford to have that. Imagine being a doctor and I start sharing with them the, the privilege of going into med school and being able to operate and, and having your hands on a heart. Father, I thank you for this heart in Jesus' name. God, thank you. The same thing that happened today will happen in you. You're operating on somebody. Father, I thank you for this kidney. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you. And the nurses are freaking out, but that kidney right there in front of them. What would they do, man? He's like, it's possible. I said, man, it's possible, dude. All things with God are possible. Now, all things are possible to them that believe. And you're a believer. It's yours. This is what it means to endure the suffering for the sake of God's elect. So sometimes being afraid is the big deal. And we're like, well, I don't want to be afraid anymore. I know that. You don't, man. People's lives are at stake. And you get to represent Jesus in this lost and dying world. And you have a very short, short life. If it's a hundred years, it's still short compared to eternity. Compared to eternity. Guys, I would like to tell you that you don't have to waste one more second, one more day. You can just blaze a trail for Jesus and not be afraid anymore. There are people here that came that aren't Christians. Y'all ought to come up here. Come on. You haven't given yourself to Jesus and you're here. Come up here. Come on. Don't be a chicken. Come on. You have never said yes to Jesus. I want you up here right now. Amen. Come on. Come on. Listen, you're here, you came to the conference, but you've never given yourself to Jesus. It's time. Come up right now. This will be a really bad time to be selfish and hold on to you, I promise. This will be a great time for you to say, I'm in. This is all in. Come on, there's more. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, if you're out there, I need you up here. Come on, man. Don't hold on to you. If you've never said yes, a big yes to Jesus, come up here right now. Come on. Come up. Come on. Don't be afraid. Come up here. Whoa, be careful. Come up here right now. If you're out there and you've never surrendered and given up, come up here right now. Come on. There's a bunch of you. I need you up here right now. Come on, don't be afraid. Yay, champion. Come on, guys. Listen. Let's start this thing out right. If you're here and haven't said 100% yes to him, get up here. Come on. Come on, let's do this. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's do this. Let's do this. Come on. Jesus. Come on. Don't let shame hold you in your seat. You got to be kidding me. Come on. It's time to be a part of the family. To get filled with the fire of Jesus. It's time to say, I'm all in. Let's do this. Come on. Look, it's like this side came up, but this side didn't. Everybody over here? Like, uh-uh. Listen. If you have never said yes to him, and you came with a friend, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry that like you've seen not Christianity and I'm not saying your friend didn't walk like one, but in your life you've been hurt by the church and you're like, I don't know if I want to risk it all. Dude, get over you and come up here. Come on. You got hurt by church and you're not ready to give up. You should just give up. It's just, let's just get over this stuff. Let's not hold on to selfishness no more. Let's burn. Come on girls. Fire. Let's do this. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
Jesus. Jesus. Jesus. Anybody else? Gosh. Listen. If you think you're going to leave and get in your car and remain the same, I got news for you. The Holy Spirit's a friend of mine. Listen, you can't afford to live for you any longer. This word will convict you and you will not make it home without pulling over and repenting. I, I promise, I'm not being mean, I'm being real. I've watched Jesus do this too many times. You will tremble in your car and come back inside and not been able to leave. I'm not mad, I'm just real. Jesus loves you. It's time we get over us. Anybody else? Mm. When I say the word Father, you have a problem. That right there needs to be fixed. Okay? If you have a problem with the word Father, you should come up here right now. Come on. If you have a problem with the word Father, you need to come up here right now. in Christianity, if you have a problem with Father, you'll never make it. So it's about surrendering to the one Lord and Father who's over us all. It's about knowing that He didn't do anything twisted or cause anything twisted to happen to you. All good gifts come down from the Father of lights. All good gifts. God is a good daddy. If you have a problem with the Father, come up here so we can get done this. Come on. We definitely don't want an attitude with him. That would be silly. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Holy Lord, Jesus, Jesus. My Lord, my King. My Lord of Lords, my King of Kings. Jesus. Holy, holy Jesus, 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 you are good and your mercy endures forever. You are good, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 you are good, and your love endures forever. Jesus, 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 you're amazing, you're never changing. You're a good, good father. Daddy God, you're amazing, you're amazing. You're never changing, never changing. And your love, yeah, your love endures forever. Daddy God, Daddy God, you're amazing, you are everything, you are everything, everything, Jesus, everything, everything we've ever wanted, we give you glory, Jesus, we give you glory, Jesus, made it all about us and we say yes to you father yes to you father yes to you father we 
say yes to you, Father. Yes to you, Father. Yes to you, Father. Jesus, 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 Jesus. We say yes to you, Father. Everything good comes from you. We're no longer orphans. We are children of our Father. We're no longer orphans. We are children of our Father. We're no longer orphans, but we're children of our Daddy God. Here we are, Jesus. Here we are, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Everybody sing with me right now. Lord God, everybody sing with me. Lord God, forgive us of our sin. Forgive a son like me. Wipe away my tears. You take all my fears. I give my life to you. My life is yours. And yours is mine. Holy Spirit, come upon me. I believe that Jesus Christ is. Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're who I'll live for. Who I live for. My life no longer, life no longer belongs, to me. belongs to me. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. you said I am your child. 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 You are my dad. You are my dad. I am yours and you are mine. 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 I am your child. I am your child. I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. Fill me with your truth. Fill me with your truth. And I will walk like you. I will walk like you. I will talk like you. I am your child. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you would mark everyone here. God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to touch everyone here. God, I thank you for all this junk being taken out of our closets tonight, God. I thank you that who can ascend his holy heel? He who has a pure heart and clean hands. Clean hands and a pure heart. Father, I thank you for pure hearts. In the name of Jesus, God, we thank you so much. 
Let every day of our lives be about you. God, you are the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you, Father, for this amazing opportunity. In Jesus' name. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the video. We came up with a website. It's called Lifestyle Christianity. We have our newsletter that's going to go out. You can sign up for our email list. We we'll also have testimonies on there, event schedule, all that stuff. It'll be amazing. We want to empower a generation to walk Christianity as a lifestyle so we can all walk with the power of God on a constant basis. It's going to be awesome. So come on over. Bless you. Thanks for watching.